Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to introduce Unit 11 and kind of do some of the initial notes for this unit. So Unit 11 is all about water and solution chemistry. And what we're going to do, is we're going to talk about how water is a very unique chemical and how when water gets, gets things dissolved into it, uh, like salts and sugars and oils and liquids and ethanol, um, how that affects the water and how it affects the overall solution. So chapter 15 is mainly about water and then chapter 16 dives deeper into this idea of solutions. When we talk about water, we need to remember that water is a very unique chemical. Um, it's actually different than most chemicals because it has some very unique properties to it. Now all these unusual as you see on the screen, all of these come from one reason and one reason only. Water does the best job, is the strongest and the most extensive hydrogen bonding of any chemical out there. If you take a look at water, it's a pretty small molecule. It has one oxygen, two hydrogen, so it's only 18 grams per mole, which means it's very light and very small. However, it acts like it's a much bigger chemical um, because it has high surface tension, low vapor pressure, high specific heat capacity, etc. All of these things occur because water um, individually would not be very special, but because these hydrogen bonds between the water molecules are so strong, it treats it a little bit differently. Okay, so let's kind of go down through each one of these. First one, high surface tension. Um, if we flip the slide over, remember surface tension is not something we talked about earlier in the year, but it's that cohesive force at the surface of the water that comes from the uneven pull of the hydrogen bonds. If you could imagine this hydrogen or this hydrogen or this water molecule, I should say, is being pulled in all directions by hydrogen bonding. And it pulls back in all directions from hydrogen bonding. So this one is kind of equally divided the forces around it. However, at the surface, all the forces are pulling down and left and right, and nothing is pulling back up. So the water molecules at the surface kind of get crunched together, or kind of get pulled tighter together because of this. And as a result, they form kind of a film or a layer that's stronger than the individual um, hydrogen bonds normally are. This layer we call surface tension. It allows us to have little water bugs run on top of it. Um, it also is the reason why water beads up on nice car surfaces and waxes and like smooth surfaces. That's why you get beading up with water. It's why water droplets fall in spherical shapes is because that surface tension pulls everything nice and tight together uh, within that surface. So water surface tension is higher than normal. It has a low vapor pressure, meaning it doesn't evaporate very very easily. High specific heat capacity, meaning that it takes a lot of energy to warm it up or cool it down. More high molar heat values, again, it takes a lot of energy to melt it or to boil it. High temperature and wide liquid state. Okay? Most substances the size of water are a gas at room temperature. But water is a liquid, which means its liquid state is higher in temperature or warmer than most chemicals its size. Again, due to those strong hydrogen bonds. Its liquid state is also very wide. Most chemicals have a large solid state, a large gas state, and the liquid phase is very narrow. But for water, that liquid phase is very wide, at 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, which is useful for us because we utilize that here on our planet. And then last but not least, the density of water actually decreases as it crystallizes. Okay, So the solid is less dense than the liquid. Now, what happens to water is when it solidifies, <clears throat> all these hydrogen bonds start locking into place and making a rigid structure. Well, the rigid structure that is made for water is these honeycomb type shapes, or these hexagonal kind of rings. With, the big, with these big hexagonal rings, what you get is a lot of empty space between the rings. Imagine like a beehive with all the honeycombs inside there, a lot of empty space that's there. Well, with all that empty space, the density goes down. Now, water reaches maximum density at 4 degrees Celsius, so ice floats. Okay, It's the only chemical that we know of that naturally does this which means every other chemical in the world, its solid would sink in its liquid. But for us, it's pretty common to see that the ice actually floats on top of water, Okay, which makes this a very unique chemical. Now, all these things, once again, come from the fact that there is such strong hydrogen bonding within the water molecule. We've already looked at surface tension, so we'll move on to the next slide. When you're dealing with mixtures, um, we have three types of mixtures that we're going to be dealing with. Solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Of these three, we're going to spend the majority of our time on solutions, but we do want to mention the other two and talk about how you can distinguish those. Now, the, the deciding factor between these types of mixtures is particle size. So if you have really small particles, less than a nanometer, 
you're a solution. Anything from 1 to 100, you're a colloid, and more than 100, you're a suspension. Um, the thing is, we really can't measure particle size very well because these are in nanometers. So what we do is we look at properties instead. So the first one is, will it settle? Okay, so if you leave it sit over time, will the particles sink to the bottom and settle out? Okay, for solutions and colloids, it doesn't happen. For a suspension, yes. Okay, think of this example of a mud puddle. If you leave that mud puddle undisturbed, it'll, all that muck and mud will settle to the bottom over time. The next is the Tyndall effect. Okay, so the Tyndall effect, we need to flip to the next slide to talk about that one. Um, so we'll do that here in a second. Now, solutions do not exhibit the Tyndall effect, but colloids and suspensions do because their particles are big enough. So if we take a look at this idea of Tyndall effect, what we see is that if you be send a beam of light through a solution, because the particles are so small there, that beam of light passes basically straight through without disturbing that beam. However, for a colloid or a suspension, because of Brownian motion, we see this chaotic motion of the particles inside there. They're all moving around, flying around. As that beam of light passes through these, par these colloids or suspensions, those particles are big enough to deflect the light enough to actually scatter that light. So what happens is, as the beam goes through, it scatters the light a little bit, and you can see the beam. Um, here's an example, again, of a colloid versus a solution. So you can see that beam of light gets scattered and almost spreads the light out. So when it spreads the light out, we call that the Tyndall effect because of Brownian motion. Okay. So solutions don't do that, but colloids and suspensions do. Now in terms of classifying them of what type of mixture, solutions are always homogeneous mixtures. Colloids kind of depends on how well they're mixed because they don't settle. So if you mix them well, you can get homogeneous. And then suspensions are always heterogeneous because you never can get even mixing because they're always settling out over time. And then finally, can you filter it? So if you pour a solution, colloid, or suspension through a piece of normal filter paper, will, the, will that solute particle, will that actually get stuck in the paper or will it pass through? For solutions and colloids, it's going to pass directly through. For suspension, those particles are going to get caught. Okay, so we say you can filter suspensions, but you can't filter uh, solutions or colloids. Now, a couple examples. Kool-Aid's a great example for you guys to visualize for solutions. Any type of that kind of stuff, salt, water, Kool-Aid, coffee, pop, soda, tea, all those things are great solutions. Colloids, a lot of times, are dairy-based products. So your creams, your milks, your gelatins, that kind of stuff are colloids. And then, of course, suspensions can be anything, really, that you have to shake. So I always say a suspension is something you shake. Uh, so, for example, orange juice. Okay, um, They tell you to shake orange juice before you drink it. That's because the pulp in some of the particles in orange juice settle to the bottom over time. So if you had to shake it, it's a suspension. If you don't shake it, it's either a solution or a colloid if you're actually consuming it. Okay, so those are your three types of mixtures. For the rest of this unit, we're going to spend most of our time on solutions. Now, when you deal with the solution, we need to break it down into two parts. So you have the solvent part and the solute part. The solvent does the dissolving. The solute gets dissolved. Okay. Um, what that means for us is usually your solvent then is going to be the greater amount in solution. Okay, so let's take, for example, uh, salt and water. If you take and pour solid salt into water, you get salt as your solute and water as your solvent. Okay? However, if you pour liquid ethanol into liquid water, you may not know which one's acting as a solvent or which one's acting as a solute. Well, the solvent is the one that you have more of. The solute is the one you have less of. Okay, So if you take a look at this image, the solvent here is our blue molecule. The solute is our orange molecule because there's just less of it. Okay? Now, a lot of times you'll see water being identified as the universal solvent. And they use that term not because it can dissolve everything, but because it's always the first choice in terms of solvents. Okay, So when you're dealing with solvents, you want to use water, if at all possible, because it's cheap, it's safe, it's easy to use. So we kind of call that our universal solvent. When we take a look at solutions, there are actually lots of types of solutions within there. Okay, So if you look at our solute and our solvent categories, we can have gas solutes and gas solvents. We can have liquid solutes and a gas solvent. Okay, So solution does not mean liquid. It just means evenly mixed, homogeneous mixture. So here's some examples of different things that can be um, solutions. So if you mix two gases together, like in air, that can be a solution. Humidity is water vapor in, a, in air, so that is 
a liquid to gas solution. Liquid solutions are probably the easiest. If you dissolve a gas into a liquid, you get like carbon dioxide, like pop. Uh, two liquids that can be vinegar or even like ethanol and water. There are drinking alcohols like your beers, wines, whiskeys, that kind of stuff. You're, you're using ethanol as a liquid, poured into water as a liquid. And then solid to liquid, salt water, and any of those kind of things like that. Now the tough one is solid solutions. Um, with a solid solution, you have to somehow make it liquid and then let it cool back down to its solid state. We've talked about this before. So a solid to solid solution is going to be any of your alloys. Now the example they give here is sterling silver, but really any alloy works here. A liquid to solid is very rare. Um, you need to basically have mercury involved because mercury is going to be a liquid at room temperature unless you put it in with the solid. Okay, so last thing of this kind of slide is how does a solute actually dissolve into a solution? So when we do that, we have two, pro we have two steps. The first step is called solvation. Okay, not salvation. It's a whole completely different thing. Solvation, where you are actually going to separate your ions from the others. We also call that disassociation. And then the next thing is called hydration. Okay, so first thing happens is you separate it, and then you need to hydrate it, which means the water has to surround it. So if you see here, these are all sugar molecules, and this particular sugar molecule is being pulled apart from, by these water molecules, so that's being separated right now, so that's during the solvation process. Once it gets away from the rest of the solid, then it gets surrounded by other water molecules, which then stabilizes it and keeps it kind of stable and... Um, keeps it from going back into the solid. Okay, so two steps for dissolving, solvation, and then hydration. One way you can look at it is kind of like wolves hunting in packs, where when a wolf goes out to hunt, they work in a pack. So what they first do is they separate the weakest animal from the herd, and then they surround it. Now, they don't stabilize it, they eat it, but it's kind of the same idea. Okay, we're going to end the video today with a, a video here of how salts dissolve in water in terms of that. So we'll end that with this today. Thank you. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecules cluster about the anions with the hydrogens directed toward the negatively charged ion. On the other hand, water molecules interact with the positively charged cations through the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygens. Notice how the big difference between how sugars dissolve and how salts dissolve is that sugars dissolve in groups, so those covalent bonds don't break. And for salts, they actually separate out into their individual ions. All right, guys, we're going to stop there. Our next video, we'll talk about hydrates. Thank you.